In this video I'm going to illustrate in a few simple ways how a propeller speed reduction unit actually increases torque to the propeller and I guarantee by the end of the video you will understand exactly why this happens and what the advantages and disadvantages of this is. What's up everyone, I'm a private pilot and aviation enthusiast and this is Let's Go Aviate. Let's start with the basics that needs to be understood. An engine's power, torque and revolutions per minute are directly related to each other and one cannot be changed without affecting the other. Power is a product of torque and RPM. The technically correct formula to calculate power is torque multiplied by RPM divided by 5252. If you have the torque value of any engine and the RPM it is delivered at, you can calculate the horsepower at that RPM and vice versa. Doesn't matter what engine, it's a fixed relationship. Interesting fact, when an engine gets dynoed to measure its horsepower, what is actually measured is torque and then horsepower is calculated, not measured. Torque is the force an engine is able to exert and horsepower is the amount of work or how fast the work is being done with that given amount of torque. However, without modifying an engine in some way, the amount of power an engine delivers cannot be changed, but we can manipulate its properties or make certain trade-offs to be able to exert more force. Let me explain using an example. If you've ever pedaled a mountain bike uphill, you'd know that it's quite difficult to start pedaling from a standstill when the bicycle is in, say, fifth gear. The pedals will move slowly and you'll need to really stand on it to pedal it and you will probably fail. But when you select a lower gear, like first or second, you're able to pedal up the hill much easier. Your pedals will rotate faster and the rear wheel will actually spin slower in comparison. But the rear wheel will exert more force on the road which will make it easier to start pedaling uphill. It's the same with cars. The lower the gear, the easier it is to pull away from a standstill. And this is all because of gear ratios. First gear in many cars might have a gear ratio of around 3 to 1. Second gear might be 2 to 1, third gear 1.5 to 1 and so on. A 3 to 1 gear ratio will mean the crankshaft completes 3 revolutions for every 1 revolution at the wheels. The wheels will thus turn three times slower than a crankshaft, but it will have three times more torque than the engine is producing at that RPM. So it's a trade-off, less speed for more torque. Gear ratios in its most basic function is a way to apply more leverage. Like when trying to loosen a stuck nut, the longer the spanner is, the more torque can be applied and the easier it will be to loosen the stuck nut. Gearing works on the same principle. By increasing the leverage, it increases the torque. If you're still not on board with the idea, don't worry. We'll do the math in a minute. All right, I'll do the math. Basically, gear ratios are torque multipliers or dividers, depending on which way you take the ratio. On airplane engines, it's the same, but it might not completely make sense yet as there are a few other things to take into account. The majority of legacy light airplane engines are direct drive, meaning if the crankshaft turns 2000 rpm, the propeller turns 2000 rpm. There's no gearing, the propeller is basically fixed to the crankshaft. Legacy airplane engines are fairly low revving, usually maxing out at 2700 rpm. This is by design, because most airplane propellers can't turn much faster than about 2700 rpm. If a propeller spins faster than that, the propeller tips can go supersonic, which severely reduces propeller efficiency and heavily increases propeller noise. And this is almost always completely avoided. But by using a propeller speed reduction unit, it can slow down the propeller speed while allowing the engine to run faster. This has several important advantages, which we will get to in a minute. The next thing to know is that torque can be measured at the crankshaft or at the prop shaft. However, regardless of where torque is measured, horsepower will always remain the same, ignoring any losses due to friction for now, because horsepower is a product of torque and how fast the engine is doing work, and the engine's speed remains 
unchanged. But the composition of that calculated horsepower can differ between the crankshaft and the prop shaft if a reduction drive is in use. Let me again explain using an example. We have an engine that outputs 100 foot-pounds of torque at 5000 rpm. That will be newton meter in metric, but it doesn't matter, let's stick to imperial units for now. We would calculate the horsepower like this. Horsepower equals torque times rpm divided by 5252. Thus 100 times 5000 divided by 5252 equals 95 horsepower. If we fit a 2 to 1 reduction drive, the torque and RPM measured at the crankshaft is 100 foot-pounds of torque, 5000 RPM, and this calculates to 95 horsepower. Right? No surprises there as it is measured before the redrive. But when measured after the redrive, the values are different. Since it's a 2 to 1 ratio redrive, if the crankshaft turns at 5000 RPM, the redrive halves the speed and the propeller will turn at 2500 RPM. Horsepower equals torque times RPM divided by 5252. But horsepower is still 95 at the prop shaft. It doesn't half because the redrive halves the propeller speed. This is because the engine is still doing the same amount of work, still turning 5000 RPM, thus still delivering 95 horsepower. So let's make the math work. We have the RPM, we have the horsepower, and we have the formula constant of 5252. Thus, the only thing that can possibly change when adding a redrive is torque. Makes sense? A 2 to 1 redrive halves the propeller RPM, but doubles the torque measured at the prop shaft. An engine making use of a redrive has some advantages and disadvantages. Let's start with the disadvantages. Redrives add additional weight as well as additional friction. This results in a lower power to weight ratio, worse fuel consumption and reduced power output. Redrives also increase engine complexity, which negatively affects reliability as well as increasing engine maintenance and manufacturing cost. The advantage of a redrive are what many don't seem to consider, which is that the engine can spin at basically any speed while keeping the propeller speed below 2700 rpm. This allows manufacturers to design the most efficient engines, which is not possible while being restricted to a max of 2700 rpm. Another advantage is the increased torque to the propeller. This means an engine doesn't natively have to produce a lot of torque like low RPM legacy light airplane engines do. The faster the engine turns, the higher the redrive ratio required. The higher the redrive ratio, the more torque is worn back through the redrive. But there is one big caveat. That is assuming the higher RPM can be delivered just as reliably as lower revving engines do which isn't always the case, but has definitely been proven possible. I hope this was easy enough to understand. It's a subject often misunderstood, so hopefully this video helps to clear that up. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.